Hi, everybody. Uh, maybe just from the get-go, I'd like to know how many people of you know the NFB? Okay. And how many people know what we do in Interactive at NFB? Oh, okay. That's not too bad. <laughs> That's good. Okay, so I'll summarize uh, very quickly then. Uh, maybe you can just switch to my visual. So we've been there for three years now. We've been releasing stuff. And yes, uh, maybe you already saw that barcode we did in co-production with uh, Arte uh, about objects and scanning objects and having story told to the barcode of an object. Welcome to Point Point. Um, from uh, was uh, launched two years ago. Blah blah from Vincent Morissette uh, interactive uh, uh, tale about communication. Um, Bear 71 that was released in January this year and was presented on Thursday night a live screening where we did uh, that was uh, no Friday night sorry that was the beginning of our, of our live screening. Um, so. Where uh, the NFB dedicates now 25% of its production to interactive production. That doesn't mean the website of the NFB, that really means dedicated uh, projects to an interactive uh, interface. And uh, what I wanted to tell you to, to share with you today was how we envision the future of interactive at the NFB, but through the perspective of, of how I got to do, to do this job in, personally in my life. So uh, it's uh, 1997, and I'm working in the corridor of the Université du Québec à Montréal, the uh, Quebec University in Montreal. And I'm going to meet Jean-Pierre Maas, who's responsible for the master degree in, um, in uh, documentary. And I want to work on a thesis on cinéma vérité. And um, you know, I came from a philosophy background. I studied in a monastery, didn't want to be a monk or anything, I just want a calm environment where to study. So I don't know Jean-Pierre, so I just walk in his office, first time I meet him, and I don't even have time to sit down and start talking. He says, why do you want to do this? Why do you want to write something that nobody will read ever and it will sit on a shelf? Why don't you do something that people will see? And ultimately he just stands up and we start walking back in the corridor. And the last thing I know, he's gone and I have the application form of uh, multimedia uh, art in my hands and I was like five minutes before that I was trying to just know how to go into doing a master's in the cinema vérité and I'm like what's happening because I'm not a tech guy at all I have like a poor PC like Windows 3.0 sometimes I play pinball on it but mostly it's like for text and at that point, at that time in my life, I was uh, in that part of my studies, I was a lot studying the philosophers of language at the beginning of the 20th century. And I'm really fascinated by the emergence of meaning and how does it appear and how does it work. And uh, really into Wittgenstein and the, all forms of language and this notion that words are not uh, the definition of words are not something that exists inside objects or definition of words are not things that exist like as a representation all made up in our head but somewhere in between the two somewhere in the middle in the context in the way we use words um, in the forms of life in which they appear and at the same time of that I'm kind of digging at the in my local library in VHS, old VHS documentaries of the NFB and starting to discover that. And that was a very important point, uh, a discovery point in my life because I discovered Pierre Perrault. And Pierre Perrault is really a pioneer of what we call today cinema direct, cinema vérité. Um, Pierre Perrault, it's in particularly that piece, that piece here. Dans le bois, avec des chums, prendre un coup solide, se compter des salades, C'est le silence. C'est ça qui est important. C'est pas dire un asti de mot. Il y a pas une femme. So, I think I'm the only one understanding here in this piece. So we're two perfect, excellent. The particularity of Pierre Perrault is that uh, it's really the cinema de la parole. It's really the cinema of speech, cinema of language, and he's kind of we, we can call him like a hunter of authentic speech, and but. 
is not uh, it's, it's not in a quest for the perfection of language or the perfection of how language is expressed, but maybe the opposite. It's exploring the poetry of the everyday life language. How does it take form um, in the use of we do of language? So this is the tale of friends that go on a hunting trip, and it's really about the relation between uh, the wilderness and human activity, uh, relation uh, facing death and about friendship. And this was a very important turning point for me because it kind of made me move away from books and deepen my fascination uh, of emergence of meaning through media. And I was really intrigued about how, the how can we work about uh, the emergence of meaning through media. So when I was in the middle of that, uh, out of that corridor with the uh, appli application form of multimedia in my hands, and that Jean-Pierre uh, left me and went back to, to, uh, to his own, to his office. Um, I was really interested into exploring that through multimedia. How does um, language work not only as words, but also as sound, as still images, as moving, moving images, but also the other possibilities that enhanced by multimedia, the way that you can interact with the piece, you can change his, uh, his flow, his direction. Um, the hypertextuality hyper of multimedia was very intriguing for me because it's a form of poetry. It lets the reader uh, or the user generate meaning. And the role of the producer and the creator is really to create a context with a specific subject, but in which he proposes a set of possibility where people can use the content and let uh, the meaning emerge. So why am I talking about the future and still relating 50 years uh, back again? Uh, well, because the NFB has always been a, a very important place of innovation. Uh, IMAX was born at the NFB, Cinema uh, Virte was born at the NFB. And the, this particular example I want to show you is very telling about how we see the future of Interactive at the NFB. Um, and this is how the Interactive Studio was born in the footstep of that great tradition. That's a 1958 film, and it's called Les Raquetteurs. And I'm going to try to stop it at the right moment. It's a film, it was a, like a four minutes uh, ordered film, like a, on a newsreel format. And we have to remember that before 1958, all uh, documentary, the, all the sound was created on post production, uh, reconstitution. And uh, so, when, just need to stop it exactly at, the, at the, the good timing. So it's about a snowshoe congress. Very interesting. And, um, but the team that uh, created the, this piece was uh, Michel Brou, Gilles Grou, and Marcel Carrière. And they're really the guys who invented Cinema Direct, and they were really into... Okay, sorry. I don't know why. They, they were really into... Um, very fascinated about how can we uh, let reality talk for itself. So Michel Bro uh, falsified the film roll order form by adding a zero for film rolls. So he had like huge quantity so they could film and film and film. And in the editing room, um, Gilles Grou, uh, because, okay, the little story is that the managers at the NFB said, this is not interesting, do not make this film anyway, even if you shot. So, and they thought, yes, we have to do it. So they secretly edited the film at night, pretend, pretend, uh, 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 pretextant, pretexting, uh, over time on another project. And the editor uh, is uh, Gilles Grou, and at some very specific point. Okay. 
Okay, so you see right here, this is Marcel Carrière. He's the, the, sound, uh, the sound guy on the project. And he, um, he, he puts the, the, the sound recorder on the, on the street. So the editor realizes that he can coordinate sound to film. And that, so this is a very important moment in time because this is where um, Cinema Virté is born because you sing sound to images and uh, it changes the course of documentary. And from that point, Marcel Beau brings the film to California for a seminar, meets Jean Rouge, then meets Edgar Morin, and uh, the rest is history. But when, uh, from this point, Michel Beau starts talking about the documentary, about the camera and the microphone as captors of reality, that technologies become sensors of reality. So the big lesson for us is, what do technology teach us uh, about reality when we listen closely? How can technology can give us um, ideas or paths about creating new ways of telling the story of reality? How I would be interested in the next five years doing something on migration using a GPS. I would be interested of doing something on friendship using the SMS. I would be interested in some, doing something on depression using brain activity uh, sensors. So what I want to share with you now is uh, maybe three, um, three ideas or three ways that uh, I wish to see us going uh, in the next five years. The first one is really about the public. Um, we still, we have a problem right now that we're still de delivering interactive pieces like we do with films, like one after another separated from one to another. There's no continuity from one to another. We see how the traffic goes, people come to uh, specific projects, they go out, they, go, they don't go see the other stuff. So we need to change our relationship with the audience. It's not just from one piece, it's a, it's a continuous uh, dialogue that we, that we want to build. In space and in time. We're a public service and there's no public service without the public. We're not outside the public, we're not a service for the public, we're inside the public. We have to play uh, uh, a part uh, in, in people's lives. So the question is really, what role do we want to play in people's lives and what place do we occupy in the rhythm of their lives? So that means that from the moment you start asking yourself this question, it's going to change the way you choose your subjects, the way you program, the way you produce, the way you deliver the, the, the projects, how you let people uh, get inside your projects because the dialogue be becomes intrinsic to the production itself. And if, particularly in documentary, if documentary is the art of interpreting reality, if documentary is a representation of the world or of a thematic or of a subject, if people are actively engaged in the experience, how does it change the representation of the subject itself? I'm going to show you one example, a project, uh, Carl Insomnia. I'm going to show you a quick example and tell you the story right after. I can't sleep. Are you asleep? Oh, you're awake, like me. Do you want to talk to me? Come in. What you say to me will be used to create a journal of insomnia.
How do you feel physically? Uh, I physically feel absolutely horrible. It's, uh... During the day, are you anxious about the coming night? Describe the room you are in. What is your relationship with your alarm clock? What do you think of sleeping pills? I don't want to to rely on them. What is preventing you from so, sleeping? Um, if I do it, I guess it's probably because I can't turn off my, my mind. What time is it? It's just, uh, what is your relationship with the body? How does lack of sleep affect your health? It saps all my energy. I'm, I'm very tired. How often are you sleepless? What techniques help you get to sleep? What are you thinking right now? So the part one of the project is really like a call for content. It's insomnia asking questions to the insomniacs and they can answer like you saw with the webcam or the keyboard or the, the, the mouse for drawing. And the idea is really to, because insomnia is such a great subject to uh, treat on the internet, because internet in some ways is kind of the insomnia. Uh, you can know where people are in place and in time. You can know if they're insomniacs or not. You can connect people with, with themselves. And the idea is to collect for a certain period enough material that will be the assets uh, the material for the designer, the programmer, the sound artist, the videographer, this will be their, the, the content they will work with uh, for the, the second phase that will come out uh, in the beginning of uh, 2013. And more and more we're going to see people being part actively in the creative content of uh, the project and not as participatory as a, a very collaborative, as a it's a very easy buzzword and it's a very easy tactic, but uh, it's, it's a trap because if you just open a box and you say react or say you, what you want, it's not interesting. What ma makes interesting is really a creative dialogue between the creator and the public. The other, t other challenge for us is, to, uh, is the interactivity itself. Since I when I arrive at the NFB, one of my job is producing. The other part of my job is really uh, strategic development. So I was I arrived to create the studio and start everything from scratch and and build it. And we had these sessions. We would inform and share with uh, the staff at the NFB and creators about where we were going, what was the vision, etc. And all the time I was going into these deep discussions about like what is interactivity and what is linear and non-linear and my film is non-linear and I'm interacting with the brain of the people, and, and I thought it was a very distracting, uh, uh, it's, it was a, almost like a conceptual distraction, and we were just playing with words, and I kind of dug to find out what was the, the first definitions or the first appearance of interactivity, and the oldest form I found was in the um, ancient Greece, there was, they built like a aeolian harp, it's like imagine the body of a guitar, with, with uh, steel strings, and they would put it in a place where there would be sufficient wind to create sound, but they would hide it. They, you could not see it, so you had the impression it was like the gods that were starting to sing and make you fear something, I don't know what. But it's the interaction between different elements in space that the result will be, uh, will be the interaction between the way the, the, all the, the elements played between themselves. So one of our challenge is to make interactivity as seamless and as transparent as possible. Uh, one and a half years ago, we released a project called Blah Blah, maybe some of you have seen. And what's interesting about Blah Blah is that there's one instruction and it's click anywhere. And the goal is to... Um, it's a project about language. You go through six chapters with this character that is evolving. And um, the idea is to make the technology uh, invisible. And while the, the project was in a very active state, 
we uh, realized that uh, looking at stats coming in, that lots of stats started coming from the indie gaming culture. And I don't know how many of you know about indie gaming, but indie gaming is to the world of gaming what indie pop or indie rock is to the world of uh, music, not totally underground, but somewhere avant-garde and a more artistic base. So we started looking at all these projects in the indie gaming world and we we're very inspired. And next, the next Vincent Marset project will be more of a game, but we're trying to learn all this grammar and syntax and language around the game. And even in interactive documentary projects, we started in, in involving uh, game designers because game, if there's a space in the industry where interactivity is really developed, is, uh, is the gaming industry. But also to understand that all the actions you take are part of the story. And we have this, um, always this, uh, this default, or this, uh, not the default, of it's always action for content action for content and we've we've made that mistake we make that mistake almost at each project and the goal is to bring the two together how is action part of the content how is the user experience the storytelling in itself and that's where the the, the game world really got something there and the third thing where uh, I wish to see the, the the studio go in the next five years is more and more things the projects outside uh, traditional screens, uh, and I would I'll call the desktop uh, uh, traditional screen uh, at this point. More and more media exiting these screens. Uh, we have to think about the setting, the context in which the public uh, discovers the media, use it. More and more moving or waiting in waiting spaces, uh, in public spaces. It can be very common places or museums or music festivals or Nuit Blanche all over the world that program um, this. We, um, in Montreal, at the heart of the downtown, there's a district called Quartier des Spectacles. Quartier des Spectacles. Quartier des Spectacles is a um, district of entertainment, shows, venues, uh, really culture oriented. And there's been lots of effort put into making uh, there's 12 surfaces right now and it's going to be growing where you have uh, interactive uh, media on them and you're going to see we had uh, we made an installation with blabla uh, last uh, june so we brought it outside uh, on this uh, giant uh, wall but what i want to show you is that on in this we're gonna do work on this building in particular, which is a, a university a campus. And we, when we start talking with the, um, these producers, we're thinking, how can we, how can we announce the fact that we're outside in a public space with a building inside of us? A building is an academic building. The fact that we can interact with the building, but we can interact with each other also. So what do we want to uh, develop as content with this type of context? And it, we decided to work on the idea of the recon reconciliation between the individual and the collective in a time where issues are become universal, they're not only local. So we're gonna make a project, it's called a megaphone, and it's a speech-to-text project. You're gonna have in front of the building you're gonna have like a huge megaphone and people will, when they will say something, it will appear in real time with giant letters uh, on the building there. And the idea is to reflect on what it means today to take speech publicly because we're in a world where you can take instant instantaneously and independently, uh, you can take speech at any times and reach and publish and reach like hundreds or thousands of people. but what's what's the meaning of it and what's the responsibility and what are the impacts of uh, taking speech publicly montreal and we're in partnership with a, a network of connected cities there's uh, nine european cities in which we're partner with and we're trying to make the uh, the pieces go from one place to another 
Yep. Yeah, I've had that. I'm at my out. It's, it says out, and I have three sentences. Yeah, so they are. The NFB is a public institution. Its future lies in its uh, relevance, in social relevance, and the way we occupy a place in people's lives. So the last three years, we identified a field. We dug a hole, took a tree, planted the tree, watered it. But now that the tree is underground, its roots must dig far enough to make it impossible for anybody to uproot. <laughs>